Well, welcome back to the Art of the Matter. Last week's Old Testament reading was the Lord's giving of the Ten Commandments to Moses, beginning with the crucial admonition, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above or that is on the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. Now this is the foundation on which everything else rests. The Lord God, the one who brought the Israelites out of slavery in Egypt, the Lord God will be the Israelites' only God, and the Israelites will be God's particular people. All the conditions of this will be spelled out later in Exodus and the book of Deuteronomy. But everything hinges on this covenantal relationship. It's a little like a marriage in that this covenant applies day and night, in sickness and in health, for richer or for poorer, no matter where they are or what they do. The Israelites and God are to be bound together. In a relationship such as this, there is no separation of sacred from secular. The covenant governs all aspects of life. And by the way, this integration of sacred and secular is the theme for this week's sermon series on the God-saturated life. And these verses suggest that God knows something about human beings that we may not know about ourselves. And that is that we are made in such a way that we will worship something or someone. It's in our nature. And if the Lord is not our God, then we'll put something or someone in his place. As Bob Dylan put it some years ago, it may be the devil or it may be the Lord, but you're going to have to serve somebody. So God does what he can to warn the Israelites about worshiping other gods, about bowing down before something man-made, thus debasing themselves and their relationship with him. But Moses has been gone for 40 days now, and without him to remind them of their covenant with God, they decide to make their own God, or rather, have Aaron make it for them. Our reading for today says, when the people saw that Moses was so long in coming down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron and said, Come, make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses, who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't know what has happened to him. Aaron answered them, Take off the gold earrings that your wives, your sons, and your daughters are wearing, and bring them to me. So all the people took off their earrings and brought them to Aaron. He took what they handed him and made it into an idol cast in the shape of a calf, fashioning it with a tool. Then they said, this is your God, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar in front of the calf and announced, Tomorrow there will be a festival to the Lord. Now let's just pause a moment to take those words in. When Aaron saw this, the fact that they were going to start worshiping this calf, he built an altar in front of the calf and announced, tomorrow will be a festival to the Lord. Now, this is precisely how false religion, alternative religion, a cult, that's how it works to pass itself off as the real thing. It clothes itself in the trappings that resemble true faith. It builds altars and rebaptizes a pagan festival as a festival to the Lord. Moving on, so the next day the people rose early and sacrificed burnt offerings and presented fellowship offerings. Afterward, they sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in revelry. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go down, because your people, whom you have brought up out of Egypt, have become corrupt. They have been quick to turn away from what I commanded them, and have made themselves an idol cast in the shape of a calf. 
They have bowed down to it and sacrificed to it and have said, This is your God, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. I've seen these people, the Lord said to Moses, and they are a stiff-necked people. Now leave me alone so that my anger may burn against them and that I may destroy them. Then I will make you into a great nation. But Moses sought the favor of the Lord his God. Lord, he said, why should your anger burn against your people, whom you brought out of Egypt with great power and a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say, it was with evil intent that he brought them out, to kill them in the mountains and to wipe them off the face of the earth? Turn from your fierce anger, relent and do not bring disaster on your people. Remember your servants, Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, to whom you swore by your own self, I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky, and I will give your descendants all this land I promised them, and it will be their inheritance forever. Then the Lord relented and did not bring on his people the disaster he had threatened. Now, it's most likely that what the Israelites wanted was something like what they had seen in Egypt, a statue of the so-called god Apis, one of the most important Egyptian deities, which took the form of a bull and which they worshipped for its kingly power, strength, and fertility. These are images of this Egyptian bull, which was frequently crowned with a golden disc And in the middle of the disc, there sometimes appeared an image of an upright spitting cobra, as you can see in the example on the left, a symbol of the Pharaoh's divinity and power. On the right, you can see that over time, it metamorphosed into a being with a human body and a bull's head, rather like a minotaur. Now, before we dismiss the Israelites' form of idolatry as primitive, something we've long since outgrown. You might consider the importance we attach to one of our favorite symbols, the raging bull of Wall Street. Some might say it's just a statue, a symbol, but symbols can be freighted with a whole lot of meaning. And I don't think anybody could seriously argue that this symbol doesn't mean a whole lot to a whole lot of folks here in America. I know a number of people who regularly check their smartphone or their television feed to see how the Dow is doing. How many people gauge the health and overall prosperity of our country by citing a bull market? The USA must be doing well. Take a look at the stock market. Damien Hurst might have been poking a little fun about this when he embalmed a golden calf in formaldehyde after first embellishing it with solid 18-karat gold hooves, horns, and a sun disc on its head. The calf is contained in a glass and gold-plated steel tank that measures over two meters, and the tank stands on a marble plinth. It was sold at auction at Sotheby's for $18.5 million. What sort of statement might the buyer of this suddenly famous art object be making when he or she displays it in their house or gallery? What does it say about us and about the world of art? That this embalmed creature swimming in formaldehyde, this golden calf, could be a highly sought-after art object so sought after that it would sell for eight and a half million dollars. I will leave those questions with you to ponder. Far more sinister to me is this photo montage entitled The Minotaur or The Dictator. It was created by Erwin Blumenfeld, one of the most successful photographers of the 20th century, whose avant-garde surrealist style was brought to bear on portraits, nudes, fashion, and advertising. He has placed a calf's head on top of a statue of a male torso and decorated it with a garment 
something like a toga. The year being 1937, and Blumenthal being a German Jew working in Europe and publishing this image that he called the Minotaur or the Dictator, it's probably fair to say that he was very fortunate indeed to escape Europe by the skin of his teeth in 1941 and find refuge in New York City, where he enjoyed a brilliant career with Harper's Bazaar, Vogue, Life magazine, and other publications. Even more sinister is this take on Blumenthal's image by Francis Picabia, the French avant-garde painter, which he called the Adoration of the Calf. Gone is any reference to gold. This painted creature actually looks like a very muscular, powerful minotaur without the horns. And the blue toga even seems to confer a suggestion of royalty. But the head is such a disturbingly different color from the body. And the mouth is hideous with stained, crooked teeth. The pink around this creature's muzzle suggests that it is alive. And yet, it seems blind and brutish. It towers over all the hands that Picabia has painted reaching toward their idol in adoration. And yet the idol seems not to see them at all. The creature is completely oblivious to their presence. And the crowd seems to worship blindly, since the artist has not given them faces or eyes, just desperate hands, worshiping an idol that seems to come straight out of a nightmare. It's inevitable that we will serve, we will worship something, someone. We'll give all of our attention to something. We're simply hardwired to do that. But if we worship anything or anyone other than the creator, we're settling for something less, or worse, an illusion. That was the subtle point René Magritte made when he created his famous painting called the Treachery of Images, or Ceci n'est pas une pipe, this is not a pipe. And if this is not a pipe, what is it then? That's the question. Well, it's an image of a pipe. It's not the real thing. Magritte suggests that images can be treacherous. They can be very seductive. It's so easy to be seduced by an illusion that resembles the real thing. And in a time such as ours, we've grown so accustomed to virtual reality and alternative facts that the very existence of truth seems to be called into question. Who's to say what is true and what is false? What is illusion or what is reality? The closer we stay to our creator, the less we'll be tempted to succumb to the lure of an illusion, an idol, a counterfeit god. The last work of art that we'll look at that treats the worship of the golden calf is by Nicolas Poussin. It's in the National Gallery in London. It's an imposing work measuring about five by seven feet. On the right, we see Aaron dressed in white gesturing towards the bull he has made from the gold given him by the Israelites when they asked him to make them a god. The people on the right, responding to Aaron's proclamation, raise their hands in adoration, just as we saw in the Picabia painting a moment ago. In the left and middle foreground, we have a group of dancers joyfully circling the golden calf or to be more precise, the golden bull, because this is one big animal. In the background on the left, we see Moses and Joshua descending the mountain. They have been sent back by God, dismissed, as God tells them that your people, the ones you led out of Egypt, have thrown off all restraint. They've become corrupt. They're bowing down and making sacrifices before an idol cast in the shape of a calf. 
Moses, in despair and disgust, is hurling down the stone tablets on which the laws of God, the terms of the covenant, have been written. I think there is something menacing, disturbing about this picture, in spite of the fact that it features a group of apparently joyous dancers. Let's contrast it with another painting of Poussin's, done about the same time, which also depicts a group of dancers. This is more like a bacchanal, with the woman in blue on the left squeezing grapes into a cup held aloft by a drunken little cherub. There are festive garlands. On the right, a satyr embraces a young woman, and just above them is a statue, a satyr-like figure with horns, probably symbolizing Priapus, the god of virility, fertility, spring, and gardens. It's a completely pagan scene of Dionysian revelry. An historical note here, the ballet de cour, or court ballet, had become very popular in Italy and France at the end of the 16th century and remained in vogue through much of the 17th. The dances were performed by members of the court, including the king himself. Louis XIV was said to have been an avid participant in these court ballets, as were a number of his courtiers and members of the nobility. The court ballet was the forerunner of ballet as we know it today, and Poussin was depicting moves that could be seen in these dances that took place at palaces and chateaus throughout Europe. I'm sure his own patrons would be delighted to recognize dance steps that they had performed themselves or had seen their monarch performing. If you compare the two pictures, you notice that the atmosphere in each is very different. The scene of the golden calf has dark, threatening clouds in the background, and the crowd of many figures seems squeezed and pushed together by the two banks of rock on either side. The horizon line is high, and there's very little room for the sky. The space feels oppressively closed. The general atmosphere is tinged a rather lurid yellow, and the two trees framing the golden calf are almost barren. The scene on the right is completely different. There is lush greenery, the sky is a bright blue, and you see more of it because the horizon line is lower. The left side of the picture opens the entire composition up. Since there are fewer characters, there is no sense of crowding, and it seems altogether more lighthearted and genuinely festive in a debauched sort of way. Don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to promote Bacchanalian revelry, but I do want to point out the means that Poussin has employed to make the scene of the golden calf more menacing and oppressively heavy, especially when compared with the scene on the right. You may also have noticed a striking mirror effect when the two paintings are placed side by side. Take a look at the group of dancers enclosed in the red rectangle. Now take a look at the dancers enclosed in the green rectangle. Let's put them side by side. And now flip the figures on the right so that they face in the other direction. The bodies and the poses are almost exactly the same. The only thing that has changed is the clothing that they're wearing or not wearing, and a few minor details of skin color, hairstyle, and so forth. To understand this, it helps to know something about Poussin's technical approach to a painting such as this, with a number of figures. Before doing anything on the canvas, before making a preparatory uh, drawing or sketch, Poussin created a number of small figures made out of wax and pine resin. He would position them in a variety of ways inside of a box, a small stage set or theater. The box had a set of movable panels, 
and a hole cut for the painter's eye, so that once Poussin had arranged his figures how he wanted them inside the stage set, he could alter the light conditions to get just the effect he was after. Menacing and rather dark, as in the golden calf picture, or bright, fresh, and spring-like, as in the scene of the Bacchanal. Then he set about clothing the figures to observe how the drapery fell, where shadows were cast. He would use wet silk and arrange it in a certain way if he wanted the material to appear as though it were blowing in the wind, for example, or if he wanted it to fall straight down. And then he would pin it in place. When the silk dried, it would retain the desired shape. Once he had created a pleasing arrangement of characters, it would be a shame to use them for just one picture. So all he had to do was change their clothing, change the lighting, and make whatever other modifications were necessary to create an entirely new picture. A video has been made by the National Galleries of Scotland called Inside Poussin's Box, which will help you appreciate what Poussin was up to. I had originally embedded it in this video, but YouTube's copyright algorithms didn't like that. In fact, they still didn't like it when I put up still pictures, screenshots from the film. And now I'm even afraid to put the web link on the screen because it might set off algorithm alarms all over again. So you'll just have to Google inside Poussin's box and look for the three minute, 45 second YouTube by the National Galleries of Scotland if you want to have a clearer idea of what Poussin's magic box was like. Next week, I hope you'll join me again for part two of our discussion of Moses and Michelangelo, which we began last week. In the meantime, be safe, be well, be blessed, and see you next week.